Hi, I will be talking about one clock price time games of P Space Heart, which is based on joint work with John Fernley, Raoul Savani, I am Rasmus Stephen Jensen, and we are all three from University of Liverpool. First, a brief overview of my talk. First, I'll be talking about what are one clock price time games, then previous and our results, and finally how we showed our results. To define price time games, I find it best to start without the time part, giving us priced games, and then then time afterwards. So price games has many other names like longer shortest path games, visibility cost games, or total cost games. Basically, as suggested by the first name, they are a game version of Dreister's shortest path. So we have a very directed graph, three kinds of nodes, maximizer nodes pointing up in red, minimizer nodes pointing down in blue, and a yellow star node, which is the goal. So we have we start somewhere and we try to generate a path. The way we do it is each step the current stays owner selects an outcome action. And the outcome is then the sum of this cost before reaching the star. So we start at outcome zero, the maximizer gets to choose, it can either move left, but in that case he'll get to go over zero, or he can move right, maybe getting something more expensive. So he moves right. Minimizer can either move left, in that case he might get to go for some cost, he can move right, he gets to go for five. He moves left because it seems better. If now minimizer can move up, and that's case in the cycle, or he can move left and get to goal for three. So he does that, he goes through the set, paid three, and now maximizer's turn, he can either, uh, he has no option, he, he just goes to goal. We see that the outcome here was three. So these games have a value that is some outcome that can be ensured by both players uh, by playing well, and they have position and optimal strategies, meaning that, that if in a given state, they can always do the same thing. So this is the optimal uh, values, and the optimal strategies looks like this. Um, now, the main thing Hessian and showed was that there's a dice like algorithm with one time precisely like dice for this kind of games. Now, let's add in time, giving you a simple price time games. So in this kind of games, time is real, which is not a deep philosophical statement, but simply that it's a real number, and in this case, it's an interval zero to one. So I'm going to use this example to illustrate them from my previous paper by myself, Hansen and Millicent from 2012. And the numbers on the states here means how much it costs to wait for one time unit. So what happens is um, in each state, the current state's owner selects an outgoing action and a delay. The delay must be such that the current time is in the interval zero to one. And the outcome is then the sum of cost, including from waiting before reaching star. Let's see how it works. Let's say we start in the middle at time zero, the minimizer gets to choose his state. So he, he might choose uh, one third time unit. Uh, because it costs six to wait here, it, it costs, gives an outcome of two and he might move up here. Now the maximizer gets to choose. He might also choose one third, getting us the time two thirds. Here it costs only three to, to wait, so therefore we, we, the outcome is only three now. And we move right. The minimizer's turn here, he doesn't want to wait because it's kind of expensive at nine. So he moves down here, um, and he has two options here. And what he's going to do is he's going to want one third more time unit, getting us the time one, paying uh, two again, and then he's going to go to, to the other real state, paying three. So now we paid eight in total. The, this maximizes his turn. He has no option. He cannot delay anymore. The time is one, so therefore he just goes to one. And we get to go at a cost of eight from the middle state, as starting from time zero. Now I'm supposed to be talking about one clock price time games, which also has intervals on edges, denoting when they can be used, and a subset of edges that get reset when they pass through. I'm not going to do that though, because in my previous paper, I showed a p-time reduction from one clock price time games to simple price time games, so I just need to talk about simple price time games. That's what I'm going to do in this talk. Simple price time games, similar to, to price games, have a value, but here they depend on, on the starting time as well as the starting state. When viewing the value as a function of time, it becomes piecewise linear, continuous, and weakly monotone decreasing. We will see some examples of this. The non word part came from Boyer, Cassel, Flo, and Larsen from 2004, and it's two for all one clock price time games. And the red part came from my previous paper, and, and it's not true uh, except for, for a simple price time views. So let me show the value function for the example. I will also show the strategies. Uh, let's see, start with this one up here. It has this value function drawn in red, and along the x-axis we can see the strategy. Uh, so between 
times zero and time one third, we should follow the red edge. Between time one third and time two third, we should wait because there's no color. Between two thirds and one, we should uh, go to the black edge. We can always show the uh, strategies like this in this kind of games. For the middle state, it can look like this. Zero to one third, you should wait. Between one third and two thirds, follow the black edge. Between uh, two thirds and one, you should wait. And finally, at time one, you should go to the red edge, giving you this value function if both players play optimally. The other states has simpler uh, strategies. I'm not going to go into them in detail. So looks like this for this one, looks like this for this one, and looks like this for this one. The key thing here from a complexity point of view is how many uh, event points are. Event points are the time coordinate of the NP endpoint of some line piece in some value function. So here, this event points are 0, 1 third, 2 third, and 1 giving us four event points. This would be used as a complexity measure for this kind of games. What is known about a number of event points? Well, all known general algorithms at one time, poly event points, comma, n, comma, m. Uh, this is kind of natural because they're outputting the value functions, and the value function must be this size. This means that also any other uh, algorithm that outputs the value function of the optimal strategies must have this kind of runtime, uh, at least. No number bounds on it. Uh, there's a triple exponential in our bound by Boyer, Cassel, Flo, and Larsen in 2004. What Korsky proved this to 2 to the n squared in 2011. My last paper I showed was 12 to the n. Um, and there's no lone lower bound on this kind of thing, though, beyond some small polynomial. In my last paper, I conducted it to be at most polynomial. So it's a bit bad form to start showing up and, and talking about it um, again. Uh, it was, but it was also mentioned by Behel, Gers, Kisner, Masner, Momonke, and Trevede in 2004. It's been half the abstract on it, and it's been eight years, so I feel it's reasonable to start talking about it by now. So the main result of our paper is a lower bound number of event points of a square root of 2 to the n minus 2. Hence, the number of event points is 2 to some constant times n, uh, with a bit of a gap between the two. We also generalize that to our p space hardness lower bound for the system questions about this game. But next, well, we have shown a good lower bound, therefore we should show a good upper bound for a special case. So, Atomator, the volume player case is already known. It's an NL by Lois McKay, it's not from 2004. Weight 0 and 1 is in P, as shown by Bihir, I already mentioned, 2014 paper. Um, we have the tree question we managed to show in this paper that's the most into the third by showing the following lemma. The value function of a rule of a, k, a tree with k leaves is a subset of k lines. This is not the same thing as there being a most k many line pieces, but it means that there's most k squared many line pieces because that's the number of intersections of k lines, leading to an end to the third hour bound. Uh, fi finally, we managed to show that the underrated graphs of polynomial and event points in the and p by showing that if you go to a maximizer state, then he can just go back immediately and therefore loop and therefore never be scroll. And therefore we can just erase all edges leading to maximize the state and solve a sub game of only minimize the state and, and cold state and afterwards solve the maximization state also, which is also easy at that point. So we can also talk about other special cases of, of graph structures. So we talked about trees and underdirected graphs, but there are others such as decks, small in and out degree graphs, Planar graphs, small tree width graphs, and basically tree like graphs, if you don't know what it is exactly. Graph is small path width, which are basically path like. Graph is small click width, which for some reason is not click like, but at least the click has a small click width. Or finally, small rank width. This is basically the list of all the graph structure um, special cases I know of. So it turns out that our lower bound is actually in all of these special cases. Therefore, in any number of them, it's still going to be hard. So, uh, except for maybe a small path with, with, with an open question, we don't know if that's hard or not. But everything else is p-space hard, and that's a huge number of event points. Finally, we also managed to show that DEX, especially, are in p-space, and therefore the question there is p-space complete. So this is sort of the, the final result about graph structure we had. We know a few uh, game properties, special cases like weight 0 and 1 and automata, or the, the one-player case, they are already in, in polynomial time or better. But what happens if we have a few states, a one-player and a many states with other players might be easier. 
it might be easier if instead of having just two weights, we had a few weights in a general case. And we can also look at something called non-urgent states. Uh, so what is urgent state? Well, a state is urgent if you cannot delay in it. So trivially, if you cannot delay in any games, you're equivalent to a pi scheme and lost you on P. And the proofs by Boyer, Cassel, Flo, and Larsen, and Kotkowski, this overbound number of event points, works by changing more and more states into being urgent states. Therefore, we could sort of hope that if you have fewer non-urgent states, then it will be easy. It turns out not to be so. So in all the special cases of game properties, we have already a hard uh, number of event points. Uh, and this is all, already the case if it just has slightly more than the uh, trivial number. Uh, so if you just uh, two weights, that's all an exponential number. If you want uh, just one non-urgent state, that's all with an exponential number. And it's basically immediately uh, NP and cone P hard. So all with three weights, zero, a half, and one, uh, it's NP and cone P hard. And if just with two non-urgent states, it's NP and cone P hard. And as you add more and more uh, weights and more and more non-urgent states, you increase the lem level of the polynomial time hierarchy. And the last thing here with few states of one player is still an open question. Let's look at the formal decision question we show hardness for. It's this one. So it's as follows, given a state and two numbers, such that the value at time zero is one of them, which one is it? Um, that turns out to be p-space hard, and it applies hardness for a lot of other questions like the standard decision question, approximation questions, strategies questions, a lot of other questions. Next, I will talk about the key idea of our law bond. So we will want to implement the following procedure in a simple price time game, and that will give us our lower bound on a number of event points. So we have these two figures here, uh, each consisting of red and blue line, and we're going to move the blue line halfway up like this, and then we have uh, taken the upper and lower envelope as max and mean for, for functions, and we end up with these two figures here. And if you look at it, then these two figures are made up of two versions of the initial figure. So let's see, see it again. From here, we move the lower part halfway up. We take the upper, upper and lower envelope, and we are left with two more, um, two times as many of the initial figure as we had before. And this procedure we're going to implement in our simple price time game, and that's our lower bound. So how do we do it? Well, to get a flat line, you just take a gold node, uh, to get a falling line like this, you can take a max node and point it to goal and have a cost of one. That will give you precisely like this, as we have seen earlier. And now we want to move it halfway up. So what we do is we make a cost to go to the goal node. This is different from the cost of going to, to the red node. Um, and then we take, want to take the lower and up and we look well, Low one open envelope is naturally what the minimizer and maximizer is basically doing if they're not waiting. So um, we want them not to wait, so therefore we put give them the worst possible weight for them. So minimizer's first weight is one because that's the biggest number. Maximizer's first weight is zero because that's the smallest number. And therefore they're going to take the low one open envelope using this. So how do we then continue doing this? Well, we want to move halfway up like this. And that means we want, want to put half a number here uh, as before. And uh, then again, we're going to do the same thing like before. We're going to take the lower envelope uh, by doing this kind of construction. This is basically a, a deck. It's very uh, path-like. If you sort of think of anything on the same level as being the same node, it's a path. Um, it has low degree. It has uh, only two rates. And it has only one state, the lower right state, where you realize player weights in. Therefore, it has all the properties wanted. Now let's move on to showing complexity results. I'm only going to show the, the NP and co NP part of it. You can read the paper for, for the P space version. So to show NP hardness, one of the, the classic version of doing it is to show how to solve a set formula. Uh, the classic way of solving a set formula is to use a truth table. So you have a bunch of columns uh, corresponding to the, to the variables in the formula and some columns corresponding to to, um, to the parentheses of the formula and, and then the full formula on the right side. So the first variable will have the first half of the time be, be 1 and the la last half be 0, 
V2 will then change twice as fast, V3 is twice as fast as that, and so on. So in our reduction, we will end up having a state for each of these columns, and time will then um, handle the um, assignment. Now, after having made this kind of truth table, we need to look at the right hand side here and see if, if there's any ones in the table, and if there is, then, then the formula is satisfiable, otherwise it's not satisfiable. Well, how do we do this in our uh, part-time games? Well, the first thing we will do to make is to make it sort of a bit easier to look at this value function by adding time divided by two to the value. So not, not looking at just the value, we look at the value plus time divided by two. That makes it sort of uh, horizontal instead of going diagonally down. And next step, next modification we're going to do is to move the blue part up a bit. And now, if we introduce sort of a black line going to the middle, we see that, that half the time it's above the black line, half the time it's below the black line. And the idea is that as long as it's above the black line, the corresponding variable is true. As long as it's below the black line, the corresponding variable is false. Now, it's not really perfect yet because we start in the middle of a true assignment uh, and also end in the middle of a true assignment. So we would like sort of to take out just a small part of this and then use that small, small part as the whole thing. So this small part between these two blue lines is what we want to take out. I'm going to show you how to do this and then I'm going to use this as, as the implementation for the variables. So if you go back to our construction, it looks like this. It gave us this value function. And what we then do is we multiply all the numbers, all the cost by two, and introduce a cost from this uh, one costing max state to goal of half the smallest number. What it means is that we end up with this kind of value function. Um, and if we then move this blue line up as we, we wanted to, we end up with precisely this exactly as we wanted. So now the, this, the blue line here will correspond to variable v1, and the red line will correspond to negation of variable 1. So we're not going to allow negations in, in our system except on variables, and we are allowed to do this because of the Morgan laws. So now we have seen how to implement the variables for our set formula. So we see how to implement v1, similarly we can implement not v2, and similarly we can implement v3. So the idea was that at time goes downward, and in the first half, v1 is true, and in the second half, v1 is false, and similar for the other variables. So we have a state for v1, we have a state for not v2, and to implement v1 or not v2, we just take a max state, because or is a max function in essence, if either of them is true at a given point in time, then it should be, be true, otherwise it should be false. So we just take the max state, and again, we don't want him to wait, so we get give him a cost of uh, a rate of zero. Similarly, if I want to do a full formula, we introduce the tree state, we take the minimum of, of the two of the previous formula and v3, and that we do using a minimum state with the cost of a rate of one, because that will then just take the minimum of the two functions. Now, we want to find if there's any ones in the column over here. How do we do that? Well, it's again, it's fairly easy. Remember that, that, that this um, black line was horizontal, which means that it was actually falling with a rate of a half. So if we introduce a max state with a cost of a waiting rate of, of a half, what it allows me to do is to wait until any point until we are above this black line and then get something above the black line, if, if possible. Otherwise, if, if you always add up below the black line, well, he can, of course, not wait to any point and get anything above the black line. Therefore, if he at time uh, zero can wait to any point and get above the black line, well, he must have um, a satisfying assignment to, to the formula. Otherwise, he do, does not have a satisfying assignment to the formula. So this is how we implement the set formula and how we solve that problem. Now, to do the, the um, core NP version, it's kind of easy. We just do tautology. Tautology is a corresponding problem to, to the set for to set formulas. Uh, it's testing if there's any zeros in the formula in the out, outcome color here or here, and that we do by just turning it from max state into a mean state, and then it will be below the black line if and only if there is a point there um, where it's below the black line, and therefore there is a zero. 
If there is a zero, of course, it's not a tautology, and therefore we have solved the tautology problem. And therefore, this problem is both NP and co NP hard. The last thing I wanted to do before ending my talk is to talk about some open questions. So the first open question I wanted to mention was, there's a slight complexity gap. We have a P space lower bound. We have an X time upper bound. That's a slight complexity gap. Uh, some could work on resolving that. There are the complexity of small pathway. I've mentioned uh, our graph uh, for the event points for basically a path. But we have added a big deck on the top of it, a big tree on top of it for this um, for these formulas, and this is basically why we we losing the path fit there. So we don't really know what the complexity of small path fit is. As in, if curves are very path like, it is easy. In the general case, we don't really know. We just know they have many event points. So another question could be: What if the numbers in the input are given in unary? Our construction has exponentially growing cost on the edges. Um, are, are they easier if, if you have uh, only small numbers? And as mentioned, it's also the case, what if one player has only few states? We don't really know anything about whether one. It could be easy, it could be hard, we don't know. Um, a final question, I, I'm putting parentheses here because I haven't defined what two clock price term games are, but what is the complexity of that one? The three clock variant or more clocks variant is known to be uh, undecidable, but, but two is still open. Um, one could work on that one as well. So thank you. That was my talk.